We're running it back today with six more players to let your idiot league mates draft in fantasy football this year. Yesterday, we did part one. So if you missed that, go back and watch it after, before, during, at the same damn time. Today is six more players to let your idiot league mates draft in fantasy football. And we're going to start off with a guy. Let me tell you about this guy. He's a guy who nobody ever talks bad about. They're either indifferent or they really like him. or like, oh, he's going to be so good in PPR. I'm here to tell you that I want no part where he's going in drafts right now. Evan Ingram, the Jacksonville Jaguar tight end. And I know this is uh, this is going to be considered a little spicy because, again, you don't hear anything bad about Evan Ingram. But here's the deal with Ingram. Last year, he was fine. The year before that, first year in Jacksonville, he was also fine. He broke out over the last six weeks of last season because Christian Kirk got hurt. Let me throw some numbers up there for his 2022 season. 73 catches, 766 yards, four touchdowns, 8.1 half PPR fantasy points per game. That's you know, mediocre, whatever, maybe a tight end one. Last year, before the Kirk injury, so Kirk got injured in week 13. The games prior to that, this is how his 17-game numbers were pacing out. He had way more reception, so he was on pace for nearly 100 catches, but the same amount of yards, 810 yards, zero touchdowns, and actually almost uh, half a fantasy point fewer the following year, despite way more receptions. You might say, oh, he's had some bad touchdown luck. Uh, no, he had just five end zone targets last year, and he had just seven the year before that. He has not had a single season of more than four touchdowns in any of the last seven years. They, he is just not a, a guy that they go to at that part of the field. He has never been. That is just not his play style. So I don't want to fucking hear about touchdown regression. Some guys just don't score touchdowns. Some guys are just not uh, available. Some guys are not used at that part of the field. Okay. So he was fine for all of 2022 for almost all of 2023 until Kirk goes down. Then his numbers explode. As you can see, the man averaged 20 PPR fantasy points per game over the last six weeks of the season. I mean, over 10 targets a game, eight catches a game, like insane, insane stuff. I think Evan Ingram will be fine this year, but this man is going in the same round as George Kittle on most platforms. And even before Kyle Pitts and George Kittle in the FFPC and best ball tens, which are both paid leagues. So fuck out of here with that. I'm even going as far as taking Jake Ferguson over Evan Ingram this year in fantasy football. Call me crazy. Just don't let the six-game sample size where Christian Kirk didn't play at the end of last year fool you into believe that this guy, Evan Ingram, who's been in the league for eight years, is all of a sudden as good as George Kittle is because he is just simply not. You're just going to be disappointed with Evan Ingram this year. Another guy you're going to be disappointed with is Ramondre Stevenson the New England Patriot, okay? It's not a stretch here to to say that the Patriots will have one of the worst offenses in the NFL. I do think, like I've said all offseason, I think we need to give a little bit of room for them to possibly be a lot better than they were last year. They were the worst scoring offense in the NFL last year. Unfortunately for Ramondre, two things happened this offseason. They brought in Antonio Gibson, who Gibson's a cone. He The man cannot run the ball to save his fucking life, but he's a very good pass catcher, a very good athlete, and they're going to use him in a third down role, in a third down capacity, which is going to lower Ramondre's ceiling. And Ramondre really doesn't have much of a ceiling as it is to begin with because this is a very bad offense. They are projected to win five games. Their opening line was four and a half wins per Vegas as a team, okay? And that was tied with Carolina as the worst win total in the entire NFL. They're also entering the year with the 29th ranked offensive line. So there is very little going for Ramondre. He obviously caught the bag and got a little bit of an extension, but that doesn't change the situation in which he is in right now for the Patriots. Just don't don't draft running backs on bad teams that possibly have competition for touches, okay? So when I look at Ramondre, I want no part of it. Give me Montgomery, give me Najee, give me James Conner, all drafted ahead of him without a second thought. Next man's up. We've got a wide receiver. Listen, I think... I think this guy, Malik Neighbors, the number six pick in the draft this year to the New York Giants, will be a top five wide receiver in this league before his rookie deal is up. But this year simply ain't the year he's going to make you money and, and get you return on the investment that you are putting into him. His his price right now, anything outside of like super full PPR is just completely unpalatable. I don't know if that's a real word, but I'm going to fucking rip it off there. I want nothing to do with it. It makes me sick. The man is going the third round on underdog drafts, which is a half PPR league, okay? Daniel Jones is throwing behind the league's worst offensive line. And I'll bring up offensive line often because I think it's something that kind of goes underutilized, and it's something that will be in our draft guide 
uh, that goes live August 1st. So if you're watching this a week from now, the draft guy will be live. The cheapest way to get it, which it has all of our rankings, it's got all of these cool little metrics that you probably won't really find elsewhere in our tiebreaker matrix, which will help you choose between players while you are on the clock within our rankings. Uh, it's got our must draft players. It's got everybody on the all fade list in a much deeper depth as well. So you can get the draft guide right now by going to underdogfantasy.com or downloading the app. Use promo code BDGE when you deposit $10 or more, and you'll get the draft guide email to you, access email to you absolutely free. Plus, you'll get a free square on the underdog app. Plus, you'll get a bunch of bonus deposit matches on your account when you deposit with our promo code. If you've already used Underdog Fantasy, if you've already been a first-time depositor, you can get the draft guide for a very discounted price right now, the pre-order price, until August 1st on BDGE.co. So BDGE.co, pre-order discounted price right now, but the cheapest way is Underdog Fantasy deposit $10, promo code BDGE, and we'll tell you a little bit more about why you should not be drafting Malik Neighbors. So Daniel Jones, again, behind the NFL's worst offensive line off of a late season ACL tear. So I'm concerned about his leg. I'm also concerned about his arm because the man has never thrown for more than 3,300 passing yards in a season. The man has not thrown for more than 15 passing touchdowns since his rookie year in 2019, and the man has never supported a top 36 fantasy wide receiver during his tenure there, right? He had the one big year, uh, a couple of years ago where he was like the QB 11 in fantasy, that was not because he was throwing the ball a lot and throwing the ball really well. It was because he was running the ball a lot and running the ball really well. And I don't know how successfully he's going to be able to do that with a broken knee. OK, so obviously Malik Neighbors is far more talented than any wide receiver that DJ's had to work with. But his ceiling this year is like four to five touchdowns. A uh, thousand yards would be an insane an insane rookie year for him. He's talented enough to do it, but like, listen, his his ceiling is is seventy catches, nine fifty, a thousand yards, five touchdowns. That's not. I'm not saying that's what's likely to happen. I'm saying that is his fucking absolute ceiling, and I'm not looking to draft that in the third or fourth round. Another player I'm just not looking to draft at his price, above his price, below his price right now is DeAndre Swift. It's it's fun to talk about his landing spot out loud, right? He goes to Chicago. This offense is fun. Caleb Williams is coming in. When you start to put things on paper, it becomes a lot less fun. I look at DeAndre Swift and his outlook this year in Chicago a little bit uh, in the same way that I look at Saquon going to Philadelphia. They have, in Chicago, so many good pass-catching weapons there between DJ Moore and Roma Dunze and Keenan Allen and Cole Komet as a red zone threat that – you cannot project DeAndre Swift to have a high target share. I don't care what his talent level is or what you think of him as a pass catching back. You, it, it's 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 not logical. It's illogical to project him to have a high target share in this offense with all of those weapons. Caleb Williams is a gunslinger. He is a dude that throws the ball downfield. He is not a dude that takes what is given to him. He likes to roll out of the pocket. He likes to sling it downfield. Those types of quarterbacks very rarely check down to their running backs. Speaking of Caleb Williams, he is a dude who averaged almost 100 rushing attempts and nine rushing touchdowns per season while in college. Only 8.3% of all receptions last year at USC went to the running back position, okay? So he doesn't dump the ball off. He's also running on his own, which takes away from running back production. A lot of touchdowns, which takes away from goal line touches. Like, Swift, I, I just don't know what his role is going to be in this offense. He will make good plays and probably have some high upside weeks, but consistently, you have no idea what you're going to get from him. He's also a very, like, iffy runner when it comes to his vision, right? That's been one of the big problems for him and why he hasn't been able to stay consistent because he can't stay on the field because he is all over the place as a runner. And that's been okay for him up to this point in his career because he's gotten to run behind the Detroit offensive line and the Philadelphia offensive line. But Chicago has the 21st ranked offensive line going into this year. So he will have fewer holes to run through and that will become a problem for him. The other, you know, underrated problem is Khalil Herbert is a good runner. Roshan Johnson is, he's big, okay? I don't know what's going to happen on the goal line here. Is it Caleb Williams? Is it Khalil Herbert? Is it Roshan Johnson? Is it DeAndre Swift? Can we project DeAndre Swift to score anything more than like five touchdowns this year? I just think there are so many moving parts and so many red flags for Swift that uh, I'm just going to stay away. And if he's getting drafted in those rounds, again, like the Ramondre Stevenson area, I'm I'm taking Montgomery, I'm taking Connor, I'm taking Najee Harris over him every single time. I don't think I really need to tell you guys this, but you should not be drafting Cortland Sutton. Now, Cortland Sutton was on our must draft list in our draft guide last year. So we kind of hit that one out of the park because he was a late round pick and he ended up scoring 10 touchdowns. Now, this offseason, 
the Broncos part ways with Russell Wilson. They draft Bo Nix 12th overall. Uh, and that was something that surprised a lot of people because most people didn't look at Bo Nix as a first round talent. And now he's just going to be their starting quarterback. And if it's not him, it's an even worse option. Like I said, Corlin Sutton had 10 touchdown passes last year on just 59 catches. That's a ridiculous rate. Prior to 2023, Cortland Sutton had caught 14 career receiving touchdowns. So he had 10 last year, but prior to that, he had 14 career touchdowns over 65 games. Bo Nix's passing touchdown line for this upcoming season is set at 16 and a half. This Denver offense overall just resembles Cortland Sutton's outlook because both of them lack any sort of ceiling in fantasy football. So, again, if you're just getting back into it and you're like, oh, Jerry Judy's gone, so Cortland Sutton is now the clear number one, just stay away from this passing offense altogether. Do yourself a favor. Because when Cortland Sutton drops back down to earth and scores three, four touchdowns this year, he's going to be borderline unusable for you in fantasy football. Number six on this list, I have a hard time imagining he's going to be useful for your fantasy football lineups uh, until at least the second half of the year, if not even later. And that is, you know, I talk Malik Neighbors might be my favorite wide receiver prospect in this class. Jonathan Brooks, the Carolina second round pick, was my favorite running back in the class without a doubt. And he is coming off of a November ACL tear. He is 20 years old. So listen, it was a clean ACL. It wasn't no MCL, LCL, PCL. There's no other L's involved in the ACL tear. So it was as clean as they can come. And he is young, which goes towards a cleaner and, and quicker uh, recovery for these athletes that suffer the ACL tears. But I just don't see any reason why the Carolina Panthers would rush him back, especially behind this offensive line. Now, the O-line, you know, they 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 made a couple splash uh, additions, bringing Robert Hunt from Miami and Damian Lewis. So they'll be a better offensive line, but they still enter the year as the 25th ranked offensive line in the league. And like I said, because he is 20 years old, I don't really see a reason to rush him back because once he is two years removed from the ACL, once this offense is better, then you get the 21-year-old Jonathan Brooks. You get the 22-year-old Jonathan Brooks, who is still extremely young. So I I actually would go as far as saying I think Chuba Hubbard will outtouch Jonathan Brooks through eight to 10 weeks of the season. And maybe Brooks starts to play more down the stretch. But the rookies that tend to break out, like that happens often where rookie running backs really don't get acclimated or don't see more than like 30, 40% of the snaps until the second half or the last four or six weeks of the season. Most of the ones that do end up doing it, we don't really think about it until you know much later. They do it because of good situations and a lot of touchdown opportunities. Like you remember J.K. Dobbins over the second half of his rookie year scored like nine touchdowns in their final nine games because Baltimore was fucking awesome and running behind Lamar Jackson is awesome. That ain't what's happening in Carolina this year, right? They have the single lowest win total among any team in Vegas at four and a half wins. You just don't want to be drafting running backs that are on – bad teams like this unless you're projecting them to have some absurd pass catching numbers right like Brooks is great he's, he can catch passes he can play three downs and I think this offense will run through him when he's finally healthy next year uh, but unless you're c on the Panthers unless you're Eckler on the Chargers like y- you're probably not a good fantasy pick in a really bad offense behind a bad offensive line uh, because they're just not going to afford you a lot of opportunities you're not going to be up a lot you're not going to be uh, carrying the ball a lot you're not going to have a goal line opportunity so Brooks I am. I, he's a stay away player for me in 2024, as is Mike Williams. He's the last player on this list. He was newly signed to the New York Jets as their number two wide receiver, also coming off of uh, an ACL tear at the age of a ripe 29 years old. I'm, I'm just I don't think I really need to go into this one. I've already broke down the science. Like I said, I'm only technically a doctor, but you'll learn a lot about ACLs for me. You'll learn a lot about injuries from me because I've been doing this fantasy football stuff for a long time. And one of the biggest keys, one of the biggest advantages you could have in fantasy football to make sure that your idiot league mates do shit that you stay away from is not to be optimistic about serious injuries. Everybody thinks everybody's going to be a thousand percent by training camp and then they're not. And then preseason and then the regular season. And then they just zap all explosiveness. It was one of the reasons that Cooper Cup became our number one stay away player last year when everybody was still drafting him in the first round because he pulled his fucking hamstring in late August. Those things linger and take a really long time to recover from and they zap a lot of explosiveness. So Mike Williams being this age, with he's a player that is a role player that goes up and gets balls that needs the explosiveness from his legs to really do that couldn't be more out on Mike Williams I think this offense is going to be a run first slow paced defensive first team yeah I'm, I'm I have no face that he, he's going to be healthy to start the year slash stay healthy for the entirety of the year same thing with Aaron Rodgers so like there's just way too many red flags going on there and that will round out part two of the players y'all need to let your idiot league mates draft in 2020. 
peace out if you enjoyed make sure you hit the button that looks like this subscribe to the channel if you are new for many more videos like this and of course the best way to support the brand and support yourself during your fantasy season is to go cop the draft guide on bdge.co for a discounted pre-order price until august 1st or underdogfantasy.com download the app use promo code bdge when depositing ten dollars or more so it is heavily discounted you will get a deposit match you will get a free square on the app and you will get the draft guide absolutely free to your face hole i love you i'm out smoochies